Well, hello and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy, and welcome to another episode of Flat Earth Can't Science. One of the problems in the Flat Earth community is they never seem to be able to figure out how to determine the Earth is rotating. Well, this isn't obvious to everyone. It's easy to see if you know what to look for, and I'll show you the clues here. There are actually a number of ways you can tell the Earth is rotating just from here on the ground. Examples include sunrise and sunset. We also have star tracks viewed from the celestial equator. We have weight differences based on latitude. We also have weather patterns due to the Coriolis effect, and we have gyroscopes and pendulums. But there are many other ways as well. You know, I think that we should start this video the way that we start every day, with a beautiful sunrise. Notice that this is called sunrise. It's not called sun appearance. It's not called sun coming into the neighborhood from someplace far, far away. It is sunrise rise. It rises out of the ground. Before we get into the mechanics and the evidence of rotation that the sunrise provides us, I think that we ought to have a chat about light for a moment. Let's have a look at this view from an aircraft flying over a city at night. A couple of things that we can pick up from this. First of all, you can see the aircraft's nose right there, and the horizon is clearly below the axial line of the aircraft. That is, of course, because on the Earth, the horizon is always below your observation height. But we digress. What I want you to look at is those street lights down there. You see, uh, just to the left of the nose of the plane, you can see very distinct street lights. Now, as you look off into the distance, the distinctness between two adjacent lights is lost and they become a bright line. Also, as the lights become farther away, they become smaller in angular size. This is a typical feature of perspective. But the take-home point here is that even though the lights in the distance are very far away, they are indistinct and very small, we can clearly see that they're lights. And although it is nighttime right now here in Michigan, I can see my neighbor's porch light across the lake shining brightly on his porch. It is not strong enough to illuminate my yard, but I can clearly see the light. That's why even on a flat earth where the sun is 35 miles in diameter and 4,065 miles in the air, we should be able to see that as a light clearly from anywhere in the world. That is because at 4,065 miles high, there is nothing tall enough between me and the sun anywhere in the world to block my view. So even though it's a physical impossibility, the flat earth community likes to say that the sun is a spotlight and somehow doesn't have to obey these other rules of vision. Well, I can be a good sport and play along, so let's have a look and see how a sunrise and a sunset on the flat earth would look. We'll have a look at my high dollar graphic here and see what would happen at sunrise and sunset on a flat earth. The sun is small and local and moving in the direction of that high tech arrow up there. It provides a cone of light, and as you see from that upright object on the left, that cone of light will intersect the bottom of the object first and then work its way up until eventually it illuminates the top. Likewise, on the right, as the sun moves away and night descends on objects, the darkness will start at the top and work its way down to the bottom with the base of the object illuminated last. Let's take a moment and look at both a sunrise in Utah and a sunset at Mount Everest and just have a look and watch how the light moves. Now here is a sunrise facing west. Pay attention to the top of the mesa and the ground in front of the camera. And here's a sunset facing east at Mount Everest. Pay careful attention to the shadows and the pattern of light. Okay, so once again, let's have a look at the flat earth spotlight sun. At sunrise, the bottom of objects would get the light first. Yet, in our video from the Utah desert with the mesa, the mesa itself lit up first, and the bottom lit up last. Likewise, for our sunset at Mount Everest, we would expect the darkness to hit the top of the mountain first, and the base of the mountain to have the light the longest. Yet, it was just the opposite. The base of the mountain became dark long before the top of the mountain did. Now, one thing that was brought up by a flat earth scientist on the original video was refraction. Now, with refraction, with the sun high in the sky forming a spotlight like this, what that would tend to do 
is bend the light towards the center and tighten up the spotlight beam, making the light a little bit more vertical by a degree or two. So that won't really help us as we try and shoehorn this into a flat earth model. So let's see what a rotating spherical earth has to say about this. We will position ourselves high above the North Pole, which is the dot in the center of the circle. The Earth will be rotating in a counterclockwise fashion. The Sun is 93 million miles away, off to the left. The left side of the globe will be in daylight. The right side will be in darkness. Now at the 6 and 12 position on this circle, which represents the spherical Earth, you will see the border of night and day, or so you would think. But you would have to take into account refraction, which is those lines that bend in towards the center a little bit. The sunlight actually curls around the edge of the Earth slightly, as a result of which 51 to 52 percent of the Earth's surface is illuminated by the sun at any time. Now up at the 12 o'clock position, we have a, a large structure that is being rotated into the dawn. As you see, the very top of that structure gets light first, and then as it rotates through, the light starts coming down the structure until it finally hits the surface at the base of the structure. Now, as a side note, the light comes from the top down towards the ground. So therefore, the clouds would be illuminated before the top of that mesa. That is the twilight before dawn. Now let's watch the sunrise in Utah again and look at that mesa very carefully. Does it light up before the ground at the base of the camera? Let's have a look. Well, by gosh, by golly, it sure does. The light comes from the top and works its way down, just as would be predicted on a spherical rotating Earth. Now let's look down at the bottom at the 6 o'clock position. You see that object that is being rotated into the night? Where will the light strike it last? It looks like at the top. It will start fading at the base and work its way up to the top. Now you'll also notice too that as uh, that light goes upward, as it goes into night, we'll actually get illumination of the clouds and that's twilight. Let's have another look at that shot of Mount Everest and see what happens as it goes into twilight. Remember to pay particular attention to what part of the mountain has light the longest. And there you have it. The pattern of light at sunrise and sunset matches a rotating spherical Earth. It is incompatible with a flat Earth with a small local sun moving over its surface. We could just stop there, but there's more. One thing about science is that we want a lot of things that all point towards the same conclusion. So let's start looking at some different things that confirm the rotation of the Earth. Okay, so our next piece of evidence is right here. These are star tracks or star trails. Basically, you center a camera on the North Star and keep the shutter open for a long exposure and watch the stars arc through the sky. They will trace a clockwise pattern all night long. But what do we have here? On the left, we have a northern rotation in a clockwise direction, and on the right we have a southern rotation in a counterclockwise direction. In the middle we have stars going from the top diagonally down to the bottom, and that is what's called the celestial equator. Now there is a link to this absolutely beautiful video in the description, but let me play a short excerpt of it so that we can see it in motion. Here are some stills from the video. I highly recommend you pull up that video and have a look. It's just awe-inspiring.
Now, while a spherical rotating Earth perfectly explains these star trails, think for a moment how a dome over the surface of the Earth could possibly be constructed or rotate to give these two centers of rotation. It's just not possible. Now, for our next test of rotation, we're going to look at centrifugal force. If the Earth is a spinning sphere, objects at the equator should weigh less than objects at the pole by about 0.3%. One way to check for this is our old friend Wolfie6020, who's a commercial pilot, travels all over the world. He purchased a very accurate electronic scale and a 500 gram reference weight and then calibrated this weight at his hometown of Perth, Australia. Here we see the scale, which is accurate to 1 one hundredth of a gram, and at the top of the photo you can see the base of the reference weight, which is 500 grams. It is properly calibrated. As you can see, the latitude of Perth, Australia is 32 south. He then takes the same weight and scale to the capital of Australia, Canberra, which is at 35 south latitude, 3 degrees south of Perth and repeats the study. This is further away from the equator than Perth. You would expect the object to weigh a little bit more than it did in Perth, and as you can see here, that 500 gram reference weight gained 0.16 grams. Then he heads up to Broome, Australia at 18 degrees south latitude, which is considerably north of Perth, and as you can see, the reference weight has lost 0.56 grams this decrease in weight is due to the spinning of the Earth, forcing the weight away from the center of the Earth, being countered by gravity, pulling it back. This location is considerably closer to the equator than the first two. We are seeing a decrease in weight of the reference mass. Recall that weight is mass times the acceleration of gravity. The mass has not changed. The acceleration of gravity has not changed but it is being countered by an opposing force due to the rotation. As a result of this opposing force, the acceleration acting on this mass is decreased compared to the uh, previous two locations. Please take a moment to check out Wolfie6020's channel. He's got some great videos. Now for our next section, let's see how rotation affects our weather. On Earth, we have low pressure at the poles and at the equator. And in the temperate zones in the northern and southern hemisphere, we have areas of relative high pressure. This creates three circulatory patterns as seen on the right side of this diagram. Now, add the rotation of the Earth into that, and we have something called the Coriolis effect. Let's have a look at this clip from NOVA so that we can wrap our head around how this actually affects our weather patterns and the circulation of storms in the northern and southern hemisphere. What is the Coriolis effect? Well, it's what happens when objects moving in a straight line appear to curve because you are rotating, and it affects all kinds of things. Here, the camera's standing still. It's just hanging from the ceiling. And watch what happens. From the moment the ball leaves my hand, it's just going straight. Let's watch that again, frame by frame. Keep your eye on the ball. You can see it travels in a perfectly straight line. But what if you're spinning with the seesaw? Look at what happens when you rotate the footage so the seesaw stays sideways and everything moves around it. Now let's follow the path of the ball again, but from this new perspective. The trajectory looks completely different. Now let's watch this one frame by frame. From this rotating perspective, it totally looks like the ball is curving. That's crazy because you already saw that exact same throw. Watch it again on the left. The ball is going straight, but on the right, when you're rotating with the seesaw, the ball really looks like it's curving. Hurricanes form when air rushes from all directions into a low pressure region. So imagine there's a low pressure region between the two of us. Air is going to rush toward the center. Let's see what that looks like from space, from our camera that's hanging from the ceiling. It's not spinning, so the air, or in this case the balls, are clearly going in a straight line. But if you're rotating with the Earth, or with the seesaw, you'll see the air bend to the right. In the northern hemisphere, this creates hurricanes with counterclockwise spirals. In the southern hemisphere, it does the opposite. It creates hurricanes with clockwise spirals. This hemispheric specificity to rotation is exactly what we see in the real world. 
further confirming the rotation of the Earth. Now the next is one of two classic demonstrations of the rotation of the Earth. This is called the Fouquet's Pendulum, and it's located at the Chicago Museum of Science and Industry. I'm just going to let you watch this swing. Now as the Earth rotates, this pendulum will continue to rotate in a clockwise manner from this point of view and knock these keys down. Let's just watch it for a few minutes. Finally, we have gyroscopes. This is a laser gyroscope, an extremely sensitive instrument. I'm going to let a prominent member of the Flat Earth community explain it. One of the people in the community actually purchased one for $20,000. And so Bob thinks that this $20,000 gyroscope is actually going to shatter the globe model. Little does he know that it's not going to help. But what we found is, is when we turned on that gyroscope, we found that we were picking up a drift, a 15 degree per hour drift. That's right, the gyroscope confirmed the same 15 degree per hour rotation of the Earth as did Foucault's pendulum and time zones. So there you have it folks, we have confirmed the rotation of the Earth by sunrise and sunset. We've confirmed it with star trails, we've confirmed it with weight differences by latitude, We've confirmed it with the Coriolis effect. We've confirmed it with pendulums. And we have confirmed it with gyroscopes. Now, a quick word to the Flat Earth community. You may find an obscure observation somewhere that calls into question one of these points. However, to disprove the rotation of the Earth, you must disprove all of them and offer up an alternative answer. And good luck with that, because it isn't going to happen. Thank you very much for listening, and please remember to subscribe and like this channel.